proceeded. So now we're at the pinnacle of the program. We're going to be introducing our keynote speaker. So within your programs, you have the bio for the keynote speaker. I only want to read a portion of it because I want to share some personal insights from having had a chance to speak to this gentleman, not only yesterday, but before. Mr. Gary Brock. Gary is an inspirational speaker and writer on change and leadership. He is both a clinical psychologist and entrepreneur. When Gary's first child was born with a chronic and life-threatening heart condition, it forced him to learn to adapt to difficult and unwanted change. He has since gone on to dedicate his career in helping others adapt to change in their lives, both at work and at home. I'm going to go off script because when I had a chance to speak to Gary on two occasions, what's written in his bio is pale in comparison to the quality of the gentleman that the city was able to speak to and that I personally was able to speak to. You all may know that over the past three years we have invited keynote speakers. We pay those keynote speakers. But however, this gentleman had an opportunity to meet our city manager and he spoke about the resilience of our city and our community after that tragic incident at Walmart and he said, I have a message that I would like to come and share with the community of El Paso. And he said, I will do it for free. But it's so important that I have a chance to speak to the El Paso community. He has a heart for the people. He has a heart that just embodies what we're about as a community. So without further ado, I would like to give an El Paso strong welcome to our keynote speaker. Let's give it up in advance for Mr. Gary Brock. Thank you. That's a group called uh, Flogging Molly. What I take from uh, uh, the introduction that Bruce was kind enough to give me is I need to get a new bio. It sounds like it's not very good, but I appreciate those kind words. And I want to start off, if I could get my slides up, please, that would be great. I want to start off saying how honored I am, truly honored I am to be here. I did have the opportunity to meet Mr. Tommy Gonzalez when he and I were both speaking at a, a similar event just about five or six days after the tragedy you had here. And I was so moved by Tommy and his message and then watching El Paso over the next weeks and months, I said, my gosh, these folks are El Paso strong. And I want to go out and share what I've learned and come learn from you about how we all can build more happy, resilient lives in the face of whatever change we've got. So let's go. I'm going to talk to you today about the science and the practice of resilient leadership how to thrive through change at work and at home. As Bruce said in my introduction, change is my passion. So that's the title of my talk. I'm here actually to talk to you, with you, about what's going on in your life right now. So we got stuff going on at work. Some of it's really good, some of it's not so good. We got change we have to deal with. Right now, I would like you to think about a change you have going on at work that you're struggling with. Things aren't going well in whatever phase it is. I'm not going to ask you to share it with anybody. Don't have to share it with me. But frankly, I don't want you paying a whole lot of attention to me up here. I want you looking inside and asking, hey, what this guy is sharing with me, could that possibly help me? Could that possibly help my family? Could that possibly help my team at work? So think about what's a change at work that you're wrestling with. Number two, we all got stuff at home. You know, some of the changes are difficult. Um, some of them are predictable, like the empty nest. And then some of them are predictable, like my wife, our nest got empty, and the next year, they came back. You know, so some of those things happen as well. 
That was the change that we had to deal with. So what's a change that you're wrestling with in your personal life? Because that's why I'm here, to give you practical skills and tools to help you bounce back and be El Paso strong, hashtag you strong. My perspective comes from three places. I'm a psychologist, clinical psychologist, so I'm going to be coming from a place that research. A lot of what I'm sharing with you today comes from research, but it's not just a, an educator up here. I am also a business owner. I've been a business owner for 30 years with my wonderful wife down here. We've had our own business, and we consult with business leaders all around the world, and so I've learned a lot that way. And I'm going to share with you from my heart. I'm going to share about the most difficult change Peggy and I have ever been through, certainly me, and what I learned from that. So that's where we're headed today. Now, having had all that time and experience being an old dude, one of the changes I got is all this gray in the beard. I don't know where that came from. But here's some of the foundational principles of what I want to share with you today about change. Number one, this is stuff from my experience now. Number one, change is hard because it's hard. Some of you might be struggling. Don't beat yourself up. Change is not easy. Even positive change. Like I know we have a new president at UTEP. That's fantastic. We had a woman there who did a great job for 30 years and now we have somebody else coming in. All that's very positive, but it's gonna be changed and that's not necessarily gonna be easy. I know when Tommy Gonzalez came in here, Peggy was talking to earlier to some people, they say, oh, you work for Tommy. And she goes, oh, that must be easy. I said, oh, no, 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 I bet it's not. Because <laughs> Tommy gets stuff done, that's a lot of change, which is great, but it's not always easy. So it's all right, change is hard because it's hard. Cut yourself some slack. Number two. Change creates an opportunity for everybody in this room to step up and lead. You're not a leader because of your title. You're not a leader because of how much money you make or what kind of car you drive or what neighborhood you live in. You are a leader simply if people follow. And you know who people follow? People doing the right thing. So change is an opportunity for everyone to step up and lead. And if you think about it, if there were no change, we don't need leaders. Stop and think about it. If there's no change, could you imagine somebody, we've got the elections going on now, could you imagine somebody getting up, they go, vote for me, I promise to do absolutely nothing. I'm not going to change a thing. I can guarantee you in 20 years we won't change a thing. We had, uh, there was a, the Chicago Fire Department, I love a quote from a guy there I saw one time, a, a police, uh, fire chief. He said, I would describe the Chicago Fire Department as 175 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. You know, so change is going to happen, and we need leaders to show us the way. Sometimes we need leaders to show us what needs to change. This is your opportunity. Whatever change you're going on, it's your opportunity. Third foundational principle, that's going to take some courage. Because I can guarantee you, if you're going to be changing something, there's going to be some people who don't like it. I remember when I first got into this business, I went and visited with the pastor of the biggest church in the town where I lived. He's my first consulting guy. I said, hey, I'm going to go in the business and help people with change. What can you tell me about change from your job? You're the pastor of the biggest church in town. He says, well, Gary, what I would say is the people who hired me brought me in because they said they wanted me to change a bunch of stuff. Ever since I've been here, those very same people have thought, have thought every change I've tried to do. And that's kind of the nature of the game. People, a lot of people don't like change, so it takes a little bit of courage. It takes courage to step up and say what needs to be said. Resilient leaders have those skills. I'm going to try to give you those. So therefore, leadership, which anybody can be a leader, if you just step up, see what needs to be done, and do it. And if, people are doing, if you're doing the right things, people will follow. Leadership at work and at home and in your communities starts with managing yourself. Because you see, leadership and management are two different things. Like Tommy Gonzalez, his title is city manager, and he's got a lot of management responsibility. Management's about controlling, regulating, tracking, and all that kind of stuff. It's numbers, it's charts, it's graphs, it's scheduling, it's processes. Very important. Leadership is inspiring people to do all that. Management's about stuff. Leadership's about people. If you want to lead people, and help them be more resilient, you got to manage yourself, which means you have to control, manage, and regulate how you think and how you feel. Because one of the things that research shows from psychology is that our attitudes and our emotions, they're literally infectious. 
For example, have you ever worked in an office where you had somebody and their attitude was like that dog on the far left? You ever worked with somebody like that? I hope you're not that, that dog, because that dog's attitude will just kind of sweep through the entire office. And people get drowned, oh, I don't have to, want to have to work with him again, oh no, that, not that again, and it's, it's infectious. But you know what the cool thing is? If you're that dog on the far right, that can be infectious as well. Resilient leaders tend to resemble the dog on the far right, but that means we have to manage ourselves. Because there may be days if you're trying to lead other people, you don't feel like doing it. You don't feel like being a professional. You feel like just putting on your jeans t-shirt and go watch the Cowboys beat up on somebody. But your job calls for you to do that. So, you've got to learn to manage yourself. By the way, the higher up you go, the more infectious you become. So leadership is... Uh, Leadership is kind of lonely. It's a, and it's a heck of a responsibility because your attitude and emotions impact everyone around you. And my final point for you before we get into how to do all this is change isn't just a part of life. Change is life. My mom, God rest her soul, she sent me a picture of me in my mid-twenties. I'm going to put this picture up because to me it's a great example of change is not a bad thing. Okay, need I say more? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I know. That is, uh, well, I got the beard coming back here again, but I, I think I'll leave the curly perm out of it this time. All right, so that's kind of the foundational principles. That's where, you know, those are some fundamental things that I've learned. Great. Let's get into the more interesting and more important stuff. What do you do about it, Gary? You say, I'm going to become, a, 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 become a, a resilient leader. How do I do that? Because I can tell you, hey, go build a house. Go over there and build a house. But if I don't give you any tools, I don't give you any nails, I don't give you any wood, I don't give you any instructions, you can't build a house. So I can stand up here and say, oh, you need to be a resilient leader. It's a good thing to do. Well, I'm going to give you the tools. And I want you to apply these tools to the change I asked you to think about at the beginning of my comments. Whatever your change is, say, could I take this tool and could I build something with it? Not all of the tools will apply equally, but along the way, they all will at some point in time in your life. I'm going to give you an acronym that will help you remember what I'm talking about. It's, I call it TAP. Thoughts, actions, and purpose. These are the three pillars of resilient leadership. I'm basing my work here somewhat off of, I'm adapting the work of a, a gentleman by the name of Hugo Albert. Hugo is a, a psychologist in the Netherlands, and I've been studying his work. I like it, so I've adapted it here. Thoughts, actions, and purpose. These are the things, these are the things that research and experience show resilient leaders and resilient people do. First pillar, how resilient leaders think. Because how you think drives what you feel, and what you feel fuels what you do. So how do resilient leaders think? Well, resilient leaders, it turns out, they train their brains for positivity. What do you mean, Gary, train their brains for positivity? What are you talking about? Turns out, a couple of things. One, we can change our brains with conscious effort. When I went to graduate school many moons ago, we were taught, no, your brain's kind of set, that's it. Now we've learned, if you really focus and think in a certain way, you can actually make new neuronal connections in your brain, literally grow parts of your brain that will either help you be more resilient or help you be less resilient. All right, well, that's cool, but why do we got to train it? Why don't we just, you know, why don't it just happen naturally? Well, I want you to stop and think about it. Our brains are kind of wired naturally more for what we call a negativity bias. We tend to notice the bad things quicker than we notice the good things. Now, why do you think God or nature, or however you want to choose to conceive it, why do you think we'd be wired that way? You know why? Keeps us alive. Because like if a, a hungry old tiger came running through that door right now, your brain would pick up on that a lot quicker than it would if there was a beautiful flower maybe sitting right next to you. Because that tiger could kill you. Flower is beautiful, could bring some joy to your life, but your brain is wired to, hey, let me stay alive here. So our brains are kind of naturally have a negativity bias, so we've got to work to, to create positivity. All right, Gary, cool. How do I do that? Well, it turns out that resilient leaders focus on the good things in life. They make a conscious choice. Doesn't mean they deny the bad things. Doesn't mean they shut their eyes and don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. But they consciously, every day, do little things to focus on the good. For example, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to share something with a neighbor. And it's going to get really loud, so when you hear me screaming and clapping and whatever, try to come back, because it'll just give you about a minute to share. But I want you to think about one thing 
in the last 24 hours that's been a good thing that's happened in your life? Just one thing. And if that one thing is something you'd rather not share with somebody, it was really good, but you might not want to be sharing it. Okay, don't share that. I'll let your imaginations work on that one. But if there's other things, you know, I, Peggy and I could come up with a million of them. Meeting the cab driver when we came in from the airport, who was a great ambassador for El Paso. Bruce being this incredible ambassador and showing us around. All these other wonderful people in that. Linda from HR, all these wonderful people. That's one of the, those are just some of the good things. Good things can be, hey, I, you know, I didn't fall down and hurt myself yesterday. It can be anything. So think about at least one. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Turn to somebody next to you and just share with one another. What was that one good thing and how did it make you feel? Go, you got about 60 seconds. All right, let me go ahead and get you back. Let me, uh, let me bring you back. For, for just a second, assuming you did the exercise, one of you, some of you probably said, hey, the one good thing that happened to me is that guy just shut up. So that's, this next 60 seconds is going to be great. But just notice how you feel. Just, is there any, this gentleman's smiling. I've seen him here earlier. He wasn't smiling. He wasn't frowning, but now he's smiling and she's smiling. Just notice how you feel. Just sharing one little good thing, whatever it was or hearing somebody else's good thing. Turns out, there is a tremendous amount of research around an exercise called three good things. So if you want to build your resilience muscle, it's like going to the gym. If I ask you to go run a marathon and you haven't been working out, you say, I can't do it. If I ask you to be resilient in the face of adversity, but you haven't been practicing things that can help you do it, you might not be ready either. I'm going to give you the exercises to build your resilience muscle. And this one is really cool. It's called, it's real simple. It's called Three Good Things. The way it works, once a day, usually at night, whenever it works for you, you, you just think back. It only takes five, ten minutes max. Think about it on your last 24 hours. What were three good things that happened to me in the last 24 hours? And you write down what it was. You write down the situation. And it's important to write it down, by the way, to get the effect. You write down what happened and how did it make you feel and why did it make you feel that way? Five minutes. Write that down. You know what the research shows? If you do that for one week, and one week only, and this research has been replicated over and over and over again, you will have, if you're depressed, you'll be less depressed. If you're anxious, you'll be less anxious. You will have a greater sense of well-being in your life. And the cool thing is, if you just do it for a, a week, it lasts for months. There's a lot of different reasons of why it lasts for months. Just take my word for it now, it does. That's a simple little thing that you can do to build your resilience muscle. What if when you're meeting with your teams and you're about to discuss a really difficult situation, why don't you say, hey, before we get into this tough conversation, what's something good that happened to somebody in the last 24 hours? What if you just had a little bit of a talk on a, on, on a team basis about, hey, what's some good things that are going on for us? We know there's a lot of tough stuff. What's something that's good? The sun came up today. I'm still breathing. That's good. All right, so that's a really cool exercise. Number two, to help you think like a resilient leaders, resilient leaders, they train themselves, they learn to think optimistically. I'm going to explain what I mean by optimism in a moment, because I don't mean, oh, Pollyanna, don't worry, it's all going to be great. Don't you hate that when, you know, you go, yeah, I got to go into surgery, I got, you know, I got cancer, they tell me it's about 95%. Oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But that doesn't mean you can't still think optimistically. And it turns out, research shows resilient folks, if they're not natural optimistic thinkers, they train themselves to become optimistic thinkers. Here's how I look at optimism. I think it's got three components. It's not Pollyannish. Optimism doesn't mean you ignore the reality of the situation. Optimists are realist. True optimists, in my mind, they're realist. They look at the reality of a situation. Number two, they do have, no matter how bad it is, no matter how bad it is, they have a belief 
that the future can be better. Might not be great, but somehow, some way, it can be better. But you know what? Number three, it's not going to happen if I just sit around and wait. No digas, no digas, asla. Don't talk about it. Do it, Tommy Gonzalez. <laughs> courage to act. You've got to have that courage that we talked about earlier about being a leader. You can't just go, I bet everything's going to be okay. Let's wait and see what happens. I bet everything's going to be okay. How about if we try this? How about if we try that? What if you did this? Let's try something. Remember those kids that were stuck in a cave in, in, uh, in Thailand um, uh, a little over a year ago? Soccer team. Go into this cave, get trapped by a flood, stuck in a cave, no light, no food, stuck for 10 days, 10-year-old kids with their coach. They're going to die. But their coach got him through because I know he had to think optimistically. Not, I'm sure he didn't get there and they go, don't worry, boys, it's fine. We got no food. There's nobody knows we're here. No, I'm sure he said, guys, this is tough, but we're a tough team. Let's focus on what we can do. Let's learn to meditate so we don't burn our energy too fast. Let's look for escape routes. Couldn't find any, but at least let's put some energy in someone. That's how leaders, and 10 days later when those kids were found, they were still alive by optimistic people who had the courage to go, looking for. So that's optimism. Optimism, the research says that optimistic people will see change in just situations in general. Optimists will tend to see ch change as more of an opportunity than a threat. Whereas if you're a pessimist, you go, well, things have gone from bad to worse, and from here they can only get worse. And oh, that change, don't worry, there'll be more change, and you're not going to like that any better. That doesn't exactly help. Now, I had a guy one time, I was giving a talk, and he came up, he said, Gary, well, I don't know, I'm the most I'm the most pessimistic person you could ever meet, and I'm awfully happy. And I said, well, tell me about your pessimism. He says, well, I, I'm the guy that always figures something could possibly, that could possibly go wrong will go wrong. I said, cool, what do you do about that? He goes, oh, well, I start thinking about what could go wrong, and I start planning for it. I said, that's what I call positive pessimism. He said, all right, you're still pessimistic, but you're doing something about it. You're not just accepting it. So people who are optimistic, they'll run toward the problem. They're not going to run away from it because they're optimistic they can maybe do something about it, seek solutions, not excuses. And most importantly, my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, and I got to teach myself this over and over and again, we have to learn to control what we can and let go of what we can't. Optimistic people do that. Resilience, the leadership literature shows resilient leaders don't carry cares. And when they do, they put them down. Let's see if I can do this without hurting myself. This chair represents my past. Particularly, it represents everything from my past that I am still angry about, that I am still resentful about. That ex-wife, that ex-boss, if only my dad hadn't been an alcoholic, if only this, if only that. Carrying around, this is the chair that I'm, I got all this anger about stuff that happened 30 years ago. And that emotional stuff, like that chair, this chair is getting pretty heavy. And by carrying it around, I'm kind of wearing myself down. It's hard to be resilient carrying that chair. Now, some of us go in the other direction. If that's my past, and everything I'm angry and resentful about, all this stuff I've been wronged in my life, well, this chair equally heavy, is the future. That one's anger, this one's fear. It's the what if chair. If that's the if only this hadn't happened, this is what if this does happen. What if you know, we uh, make all these investments in new technology and it doesn't pay off? What if we go to the expo all day long and we don't pick up any new customers? What if we pick up too many customers and we can't meet all their orders? What if, you know, a lot of these questions are reasonable questions, but you know you're picking up the chair when you're anxious all the time. And there's no tiger coming in the door to bite you. You're making it up in your head with this chair. You know, some of us will go, oh my gosh, you know, what if I go to the beach and it rains? I mean, we pick up this chair for everything. Those things are heavy, just like the emotions. Some of us do what I call the double whammy. This can be a man or a woman, by the way. We pick up this chair and we go, oh, if only my spouse, if only my partner hadn't left me. Mm -mm -mm. Then we get thinking about it. We pick up this chair and we go, uh-oh. What if they come back? <laughs> and you know, I'm sitting here holding. I lost my mic. I'm not going to be very resilient holding these chairs, am I? 
if I'm going to be resilient and I'm going to be able to have some energy to grab the opportunity in front of me, I got to learn to put down the chairs. And that is exactly what resilient leaders train themselves to do. I still pick up chairs all the time, but I'm just a little bit more aware now of when I do pick up the chairs that I'm picking them up and saying, wait a minute, <laughs> the only one I'm hurting here is me. Why am I doing this? This is crazy. Let me put that down. Now, let's put this into action. Here's optimism in action. This is one of Peggy and I's kids. His name is Carson. We live in North Carolina. Carson came to me when he was six years old. Never been on ice skates, never seen a hockey game, just watching the Mighty Duck movies. Daddy, I want to play ice hockey. I said, son, you're out of luck. We live in North Carolina. Not a lot of ice down here. He's an optimist. He looks up at me, he goes, let's move to Michigan. I'm saying, like, no, uh, we're not going to move to Michigan. He's a little kid. I figure he'd forget all about it. A couple days later, a couple weeks later, daddy, hockey, daddy, hockey. I said, you really want to play hockey, don't you? He goes, yeah. So I said, all right. So I said, let me go looking around. I don't think we have it here. And I looked around. I called every place. I possibly good parks and recreation. Nope, no, no hockey in North Carolina where I was. I found roller hockey. So I go to him, son, good news. He goes, what? I said, I found roller hockey. He goes, what's that? I said, well, it's kind of like ice hockey, but you know, you're wearing rollerblades and stuff. You're not on the ice. You know what he says? Nah. He's willing to wait. We're going to talk about purpose at the end of my talk. His purpose was to be on an ice hockey team. And he could see himself in those movies. He's never been on ice skates. Two years go by. This kid can't remember his last name, but he's asking me about hockey every few weeks. And finally, two years, he's now eight. Think about it. It's a third of his life has gone by. He's still waiting. He's still passionate. He can still see it. And I look in the paper, and I finally see youth ice hockey sign-up. They finally put some ice down in this large stadium in town. I said, son, do you want to play hockey? He goes, yeah. So I signed him up. I went to buy all the equipment, and I realized I made a very big mistake. This is a very expensive sport, ice hockey. I had no idea. I said, why can't he play football, soccer? I'm coming out here, you know, you would have some cleats and a ball. Here, he's got $500 worth of stuff. I got no idea what it is. Take him to his first practice, and I'm going this. I start picking up the, not the what-if chair. This is going to be a disaster. I can't even get him dressed. He can't get dressed. He's never been on ice skates, and he's going to go out there and try to play, in a, play hockey? I said, well, maybe all these kids are beginners. That's what the coach told me. So I asked a little kid next to him. I said, hey, little kid was tying the skates. I learned later, if you know anything about hockey, like, I said, hey, kid, you ever play hockey before? Where are you from? He looks up at me. He goes, yeah, I'm from Canada. And I was like, oh, my Lord. Oh, my gosh. And so I did what any self-respecting father would do. I ran and I hid. And I said, this is going to be a disaster. My kid is going to go out on the ice. He's walking like this. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. He's never even stepped on the ice. And now he's going to go do this hockey practice. And, and I know the kids are going to laugh. He'll be humiliated. I'll have to go drag him off the ice. And I'm beating myself up. I'm picking up chairs left and right. What kind of father are you? Letting him get into this situation. And I, da, da, da. But as I'm hiding, I don't really hear any laughter. So I look. Well, there he goes. He's skating down the ice. How can he do that? He's never been on. Well, he'll fall when he's got a turn, right? Nope. He didn't fall. He did a whole lap. Didn't fall down. Did another lap. All the kids are skating laps. I'm like, ooh. Then the coach goes, Broop, time for drills. And I'm like, oh gosh, drills. What's my kid know about hockey drills, you know? I mean, he doesn't know what he's doing out there. Well, I watch, and the kid's getting in line, so he gets in the line, and the kid in front of him hits a putt and skates away, and my kid hits a putt and skates away. Then another dad's next to me goes, hey, you got a boy out there? And now I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I got a boy out there. Yeah, I sure do, yeah. Yeah, man, he's a hockey player. Yeah, tough little guy, yeah. How long's he been playing? Mmm, five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what he became? Because he was a resilient leader. He had a purpose. He had a passion. He did not let it go. He did not pick up chairs when I put barriers in his way. He was optimistic. Someday he was going to play hockey, and he became a hockey player. And that's what optimistic people do. They overcome barriers. They overcome obstacles. They produce results. You can train yourself, and people on your team and your kids to think more optimistically. It will help you be a more resilient leader. All right, Gary, well, how do I do that? There's a lot of different things. By the way, let me give you a reference. There's a great reference that's called the Greater Good Science Center. Greater Good 
Science Center. And I can get that if they want to put it on the app later or something. Berkeley, California. They have wonderful resources and all this stuff. You say, hey, how can I increase my optimism? Here's one little exercise. We don't have time to do it today, but I'll explain it to you real quick. It's called, I want to develop my optimism. You do what's called my best self. I was meeting with that wonderful singer that we had this morning. And I said, hey, in five years, if your career went exactly as you wished and hoped, where would you be? What would that look like? What would you be doing? And boy, she started laying it out. And that's what you do when you do this exercise. You think about your perfect future. Not perfect, but an attainable one. You don't want to paint something that is so difficult to attain, you go, oh my gosh, I could never get there and depress yourself. That's not the idea. It's to say, well, if things went reasonably well and I really worked at it, health-wise, relationship-wise, and you write it down for about 15 minutes. And you review that for, every, for a couple of weeks is all. That'll help you begin to think more optimistically. All right, we talk about thoughts, let's move into actions. Actions are very simply, what do resilient leaders do? That's how they think. They think optimistically, they're focusing on the good, but what do they actually do? Resilient leaders actively seek out what us psychologists call microburst of positivity. And they help others around them do the same. Well, let me explain. This comes from research by a psychologist by the name of Barbara Fredrickson. She's at UNC Chapel Hill. And she's done a lot of really cool work. And she has defines microbursts of positivity are just those small, everyday moments that are always there if we pay attention that solicit, elicit positive emotions and positive thoughts. A beautiful sunrise. Somebody smiles at you walking down the street. Peggy and I have noticed how friendly people are here in El Paso. That raises, those are little microbursts for us and how we've been so warmly welcomed by you know, Bruce and Tommy and their staffs. Microbursts are those small little moments. It's the dog playing with the kid in the park that you might not notice because you're so busy walking to your meeting. Barb has discovered that long-term happiness isn't based on these big events. You know how excited you are? I got a raise, oh, that's great. And three weeks later, you got just as many bills as you ever did and still can't pay them, you know, and I can't wait for my next raise. It's good, good to get a raise, but it'll fade. Vacations are great, and then they fade. Small moments of positivity. You guys, you gentlemen are out there helping in the community. A lot of tough stuff you have to deal with, but those small moments, making connections. Making connections with people, my goodness gracious. Barb's research has shown that there's a ratio, three to one. If you can get your positivity to negative moments, three to one, positive to negative, and up, four to one, five to one, you will begin to spiral upward in your mood. If you start going down more one to one or one to lower, you're gonna spiral down. So, all right, Gary, that's cool. I see, I gotta look for microburst positivity. I gotta look for those little everyday moments. How do I do that? I'm glad you asked. There's four practices I'm gonna share with you very quickly. You can dive into each of these as heavily researched. A lot of the stuff is online. You can learn about them, but here's the four practices that will increase your positivity, increase your team's positivity, and help you build your resilience muscle. Awe, savoring, awe, gratitude, and compassion. We're gonna run through each of them quickly. I could do a whole talk on all of them. Savoring is simply this, taking a moment to savor something positive. I really enjoyed that vegan burger. Now, when I'm kind of on automatic pilot, I can just shovel it down, or I can just take one moment and enjoy a bite of that vegan burger. The smell of your morning coffee, the dew on the grass, it's not big stuff, folks. It's there all the time. It's just waiting for you to notice it. It doesn't take much time or energy. Savoring the moment. You learn to do that, you start looking around, you're practicing three good things, you're gonna see a lot of stuff to savor you didn't even know was there. Next, awe. Research shows that when we get out in nature, so many of us like to go out and go hiking or biking or walking, or even you could put in swimming, going to the mountains. When we get out in nature, you notice that feeling that comes over you and all your worries and the world's troubles begin to melt away and you're just looking at that mountain going, my goodness gracious. Peg and I were fortunate enough to be over in the in Switzerland a couple years ago, and we looked at the Matterhorn, and we're going, isn't that beautiful? She goes, yeah, I look at that and go, 
that is beautiful. She goes, some people look at it and go, I've got to climb that thing. She goes, We'd never, neither one of us got that part. But you just take the moment to take it in. And what happens in your brain, when, why do you feel so good in nature or in those moments? The baby smell of the baby's head, watching the baby learn to walk, those miracles that happen every day. What happens is a chemical in our brain called oxytocin gets released. Oxytocin increases our sense of connection to other people, and it increases our sense of social connection, and it increases our sense of compassion, interestingly enough, which is why when you're out in the mountains, let's say you're a really hard-charging, hard-nosed business person and everybody hates you, but boy, you get stuff done, you get out there on a trail and you're in the mountains and they wouldn't recognize you because you're this more calm, peaceful person who's willing to listen to other people. Very powerful stuff, awe. Next, uh, what I want to cover is gratitude. This one's huge. There's probably more research done on gratitude than anything else. And that's because gratitude has such incredibly powerful properties. I reached out to Tommy Gonzalez before my talk and his team. They gave me a lot of good information. But I said, Tommy, what would be, you know, what would be a home run for you if I talked about this kind of stuff? He said, well, Gary, let me send you the letter I just sent to a lot of the people on my team. He talked about a lot of the same things. Gratitude is extremely powerful. Gratitude, all this research, if you're stressed out, be grateful. Show gratitude for another person who has done something for you. It will lessen your stress. It will lessen your anxiety. It will increase your physical health. It will make you more resilient. <laughs> There's more stuff that gratitude will do for you. That's just a partial list. So, okay, how do I practice gratitude? There's a couple of different things you can do. Resilient leaders do these kinds of things. One habit of gratitude, the research indicates doing this once a week works best. Some people used to do it every day, but once a week gets you your best result. Once a week, it's kind of like the three good things, a little bit deeper though. Think about, think about five things that you're grateful for in your life. It's, again, it's important to write them down, not just think. The impact is much stronger when you write. And in general, yeah, you might be grateful for your house or your new truck or whatever, that's okay, but as much as possible, focus on the people in your life. I'm grateful for this mentor I had growing up. I'm grateful for the boss I have now. I'm grateful my other boss quit, whatever it might be. What are you grateful for? And then write deeply about one or two of those five things. Man, I'm really grateful about this, and this is why, and this is why my life is so much better. And sometimes what you're grateful for is something didn't happen. I'm grateful I went to the doctor and I got my test back and they were okay. You know, I'm grateful something that I thought might happen didn't. So it's all kinds of things you can be grateful for, mostly people. That's one exercise. And here's another one that I've been getting great feedback from people who've heard me speak and have gone out and done this one. It's called the gratitude letter. And what you do is you think about somebody in your life that you're very grateful for. It can be somebody from your past, parents, teacher, friend, professor, anybody, coach, dance instructor, but somebody who, wow, that person really made a difference in my life. And what you do is you write them a letter. And boy, the feedback I've been getting on this one makes me want to cry. It's so beautiful. One person said, Gary, I wanted to write it to my ex-boss, but he's already dead, and I don't think I ever shared with him this. I wish I had. Other people, boy, I did share it with somebody. It was so powerful. You write a letter to that person, one page. 300 words. We're not trying to write a book here. Try to, you know, want to really zero in on what you really want to say. Write them a letter, what they did for you, why it means so much for you. And then if you can, you know, if they're still living, if they're still in the same phys physical vicinity, get with them in person and say, do you mind if I read this letter to you? And read it out loud to them. And if they're not available, you can do it by phone, maybe a video conference. And I even think if somebody's passed away, you could still do it and pretend, um, not pretend, imagine their spirit there with you, because I do feel those spirits all the time, and read the letter out loud anyhow, and hear what they would have to say. Extremely powerful for building your resilience muscle. I know you're not grateful for what happened at Walmart. I've met so many people who are grateful for living in El Paso and how we responded. And I read about that guy whose funeral no one was going to come to, and then 500 people showed up. That's the power of gratitude, and that's also the power of compassion. 
Resilient leaders practice compassion. The definition of compassion is simple. A concern, feeling a concern for another human being plus a desire to help. Notice the action component. Sympathy is, oh, I feel sorry for you. I'm so, uh, oh, your car broke down. Oh, I, I'm so bad. I feel so bad about you. Compassion is, oh, your car broke down. I feel really bad about that. Can I give you a lift to the shop? Do you need a ride back and forth to work? Oh, you just got a bad diagnosis. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Can I help you get to your chemo treatments? That's compassion. Why should you be compassionate? Well, it turns out the Dalai Lama is right. The Dalai Lama says, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. People who practice compassion, their positivity ratio, if you practice that on a regular basis, goes out the wazoo. And if you want other people to be happy, practice compassion. All right, Gary, cool. There's so many cool ways I could teach you to do compassion. Let me just share one, because that's the only I have time for today. You probably heard this concept, random acts of kindness. Here's how you do it. What you do is, again, the research shows that do five small acts of kindness in one day, or one big act. Again, this tends to do, you know, some people are like, well, I'm going to do something a little bit every day. Well, you can if you want. That's fine. And try to, though, at least one day a week, do five little things. And when I say little things, I can say, honey, can I make your coffee for you this morning? And she says, yes, you can make me coffee for me this morning. And it can be, hey, can I go get you another drink? I'm going to the bar. I want to get you a drink. A little thing like that. It could be helping somebody rake up leaves in their yard. It can be giving somebody a lift somewhere. It can be anything that's going to help them. And you want to do like five little things or one big thing. Hey, you got a house, you're moving this weekend, I'll come and spend all day Saturday afternoon helping you move. It can be one big thing. But, and it's important to do a lot of different people. So I love my wife, but it's important for me to show it to you and show it to you and show it to others. You want variety where you're showing this compassion. And then you want to just notice your feelings again. Pay attention. Manage yourself. How are you feeling while you're doing this? It's interesting, when I started practicing all of this really in depth, I was in the Atlanta airport, I was getting kind of late for a flight, and uh, you know, there in the Atlanta airport, if you've ever been through there, they got those huge escalators, well, it's broken, so we're having to walk up this escalator to get up to the concourse, and I see this woman in front of me, she's kind of struggling, and uh, I said, ma'am, can I help you with your bags there? I probably wouldn't have done that before I started practicing this stuff, I just would have kind of noticed how she's struggling, but it came into my, and it turned out she'd never been to the Atlanta airport before, I've been there literally about 1,200 times. I helped her get around, and you know what, it made me feel good. Helped her, but it made me feel good. Practice compassion. And then it's important when you do the random act thing, write it down. Write down what you did. How did you feel? All of these things, folks, I'm telling you, will help you. By the way, it's so important to practice self-compassion as well. I put Kristen Neff, PhD, if you want to Google her. That's all, there, each one of these topics, there's experts who that's their thing. There's a guy by the name of Chicksamahai. He studies flow. I haven't even covered flow, but... She, Kristen Neff, does self-compassion. It's hard to be compassionate and caring towards others if you're not practicing it towards yourself first. A couple more things. Let me just check and see how I'm doing on time. Oh, good. Resilient leaders keep what I call a to-who list. I'll explain what that is in a moment. But it has to do with relationships. And out of everything we've talked about today, about Building resilience, building your resilience muscle, helping your people at work do that, helping your family do that, helping your community do that. Relationships are the number one thing. There's an 80-year ongoing study at Harvard. They've been doing it for 80 years, following these people through their course of their life from the time they were in college and now following their kids and so on. They discovered in that study that your physical health at age 80 is better predicted by the strength of your relationships at age 50 than either your cholesterol or your blood pressure. So you could have at age 50, have high blood pressure, you could have high cholesterol, and then you could say, I wonder what I'm gonna be like when I'm in my 80s. Well, if you also have very strong, healthy, happy relationships, you got a better chance to actually be healthy in your 80s. You can have those exact same blood pressure numbers and those exact same cholesterol numbers and your relationships, you're not maintaining them well, they're not healthy, they're not happy, you're going to be worse off in your 80s. There's a lot of stuff like that. So, to the list. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you three questions. You can think about your answers, maybe write them down. Question number one. Who's somebody in your life that you 
would like to reach out to. It's the person that maybe has been rattling around in the back of your brain for the last week or two, month or two. They keep popping up. Oh, I've got to remember to reach out to so-and-so. Or I, I wonder what ever happened to that person I went to college with or high school with. Or I wonder, who is that person that you haven't been in touch with for a while, maybe years, but it'd be nice to reconnect? That's number one. Who's that person for you? Number two, who is a person in your professional life, a colleague, customer, a boss, a mentor, that it'd be nice to reach out and touch base with them. I just haven't. Not because I have a meeting with them, not because, you know, we got to go over the budget, but just I want to kind of get together and say, hey, I heard your dad was in the hospital. How's he doing? That's number two. Who's that person for you? And then number three is anybody in your personal or your professional life. Who's somebody you know that right now could use an emotional pick-me-up? They're going through a bit of a tough time. Those three people are what I call your to-who list. Most of us have a to-do list, a list of all the stuff we got to do, important. Most of us know relationships are extremely important, but what do we say? I don't have enough time because I'm always doing the stuff on my to-do list. So cool, keep your to-do list, add in a to-who list. It's simply a list of the people you want to build, maintain, and sustain relationships with. You know why I'm on this stage today? I met Tommy Gonzalez when we were both speaking in Houston. He had to leave even before I talked, so he took, an, he took a chance on having me come in here. He never heard me talk, but he said, all right. But I to-who'd Tommy like the next day. I to-who'd him. I put him on my to-who list. Hey, Tommy, I was really impressed with your talk. Really impressed with what you're doing there in El Paso. I'd love to come out and help if I can. I to-who'd Tommy. Here I am. Who's going to go on your to-who list? And man, if you can build that. And a day like today is a great day to be building your to-who list. I know we're grabbing all these cards and stuff, but what are you going to do with those? Go stick them in an office, scan them into your computer? If you have a to-who list, you're making a note on the back of each card. Hey, this, this woman came by the booth, and she said she might be interested in such and such a product, but I also heard her say she's getting married in two weeks. When you're to-who, you say, hey, congratulations on the marriage. I'll follow up with the afterwards on the products you might be interested in. Who do you think is going to get the business? The two hoovers or the ones who just count on their CRM to take care of it? So build those relationships. So let's give me, let me get to my final part of my TAP model. We've talked about how resilient leaders think. We've talked about what resilient leaders do. And now let's talk about a purpose. And purpose is very simply what drives you. Why? Do you do what you do? It turns out that resilient leaders in business, they have a purpose beyond profits. And in business and in life, they have a purpose beyond their own self-interest. In a moment, I'm going to say go, and I'm going to take you through an exercise that I have designed to help you quickly get in touch with at least aspects of your purpose. If you have something to write on, get it out. If you don't, see if you can borrow something from somebody else. If you got a phone, do it on your phone. But I'm gonna give you a little two minute writing exercise. So if you wanna grab, see if you can find something. If not, do it in your head. This exercise is designed, it's a private exercise, I'm not gonna ask you to share it. It is designed though, because we're all running around we got to go to the store, we got to go to the bank, we got to go to the dry cleaners, we got to pick up the kids, we got to do this, we got to do that. And next thing you know, the years fly by. And, but why? Why are we doing all this? This exercise is going to help you do it. They're handing out here, they got, yeah, they got some booklets. If they, they got some booklets here. If you need a booklet, get one because they got a place to take notes in the back. Here's the exercise. Number one, again, private, I'm not going to ask you to share this. Number one, I want you to think of a child in this world whom you love with all your heart and soul. That's all, a child. It can be a grown child. My kids are grown. It can be a young child. If you don't have a child, it could be a nephew. It could be a niece. If you're an old dude like me, it could be somebody at work that just started there. You consider them like a kid to you. But you love them, at least one of them, one person. It could be more, but at least one that you would define as a child whom you love with all your heart and soul. Number two, we're going to imagine Something's happened to you, not to them. And you're never going to have a chance to communicate with this child again, except in a moment when I say go. And when I say go, you're going to have two minutes to write this child a letter. 
And it's your last chance. You're not going to talk to them again, see them again, Snapchat with them again. This is it. And you need to share with them in those two minutes everything they need to know about life and what matters most. So let's review. A child whom you love with all your heart and soul. Imagining that for whatever reason, you're never going to have a chance. Nothing's happened to them. Something happened to you. You're, you're never going to have a chance to talk with them again, except when I say go, in just a minute, I'm going to get out my stopwatch. When I say go, I encourage you stream of consciousness. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about thinking. Just write. Because you've got two minutes to let this kid know what life is all about and what truly matters. Because you're not going to be there to teach him this ever again. Ready? Go. Stop. Might not have had a chance to finish. You can finish it on your own if you want. You can throw it away if you want. You can give it to whoever you wrote it to if you want. You can fold it up and put it in your pocket to remind you because what you just wrote down are your values. What matters most to you. And you know what change and adversity can do to your values? Nothing. Those are your values. They are always going to be there. And when you face your deepest, darkest hole in life, the light comes from those values. And they will point the way out. I think of them like a compass. I can't tell you how many organizations I've consulted with Oh, we've got values. I say, what are they? Uh, uh, they're on our website. Those aren't values. Those are words on a wall. They're words on a website. Your values are when they're a compass. You know, I'll tell you what our values are. We say people are our most important asset. And last week, we had to make a very tough decision around letting some people go. And I'll tell you how we went through that decision with the value of people are our most important asset. That's when your values are real. Leaders and resilient folks have a purpose in life that's bigger than change, it's bigger than death, it's the core of who you are. And I think it's so important to remind ourselves, me included, time to time what those values are, because it's so easy in the blur of fast-paced life to forget. Sometimes tragedy helps us remind us, but we don't need to wait for tragedy to remind us. I hope this letting, letter writing exercise did. So we just did the two-minute drill. My final point to you to summarize everything we've talked about today. 
This is going to wrap the entire TAP model. We've talked about change is hard because it's hard. You can train yourself, though, to get through it. Particularly, you can learn to think optimistically. And you can learn to look for the good in the world. And we talked about things that you can do, as well as to boost, to find those positive moments of positivity that burst positive emotions, which, by the way, in business, innovation and creativity is a huge topic. Guess when you're more innovative and creative? It's when you're bursting with positivity. Think about the last time you were really mad, or really depressed, or really sad. Your scope of vision literally shrinks. You're probably not at your most creative at that moment unless you look up. You can be sad and creative, but you have to allow yourself to think, and so often we don't. They've done some amazing research that I could share with you that I'll, uh, I'll spare you, but it's incredible. Well, a little bit of positivity opens up people's minds and teams that work are much more creative and innovative. So those are things we've talked about. And then we talked about having a higher purpose. Let me put it all together with this principle. Resilient leaders find a way. They grow where they're planted. They find a way. They do not make excuses. So you pull the TAP model together. I began to learn, they mentioned this, I think it's in my bio there. I began to learn all this stuff many years ago when Peggy and I, we got married rather late in life. And anybody who's pregnant or knows somebody who is, please don't freak out, because what I'm about to share is something that happened to us, but it's very, very rare. But it did happen to us. Our first child was born deathly ill. Peggy was pretty ill. They wouldn't let her leave the hospital. She wasn't deathly ill, but they wouldn't leave, let her leave the hospital and they transferred my newborn to a teaching hospital. He weighed four pounds. He's gray at this stage. He couldn't breathe. His heart's totally screwed up. I get there, they say, Dr. Brat, your son is deathly ill. He could die at any minute. And we know it's his heart. We got our best specialist on the way in. That was reality. Now, back then, I didn't have the tools I'm sharing with you today. I didn't know how to think optimistically. I was pretty realistic, but I was picking up the chairs. Now, is he going to die? What do I tell Peggy when he does die? Because I mean, he was so sick and they didn't. And I went to a waiting room and I sat down and I freaked out. Until God, nature, however you choose to conceive of it for me as my God said, hey, what are you doing, man? The child's down the hall fighting for his life. And you're sitting in here feeling sorry for yourself. And I heard that little voice, and I'm like, well, yeah, well, my kid's going to die. You know what? I'm not too happy about that. It's Christmas time, all right? I'm not too happy about that. And then the little voice said, well, if he's going to die, you better hurry up. That woke me up. I said, yeah, I didn't have all these tools I'm giving you, but it, it was the roots of them, because I'm sitting there going, well, yeah, I can't really control if he lives or dies, can I? That's not up to me, God. That's up to you, whether he lives or dies. I don't even know if he's supposed to live, so i, I got to let go of that. I'll give you my vote, though. <laughs> Please let him live. Please. I promise for as long as you give them, I'll love them with all my heart and soul. And I, with that, I picked up my values. What do dads do? I'm a brand new dad. Dads love their family. They are there for their family, no matter how tough things are. So I got up, and I walked down the hall, and I stopped feeling sorry for myself. I wasn't happy, but I felt peaceful. And I chose, my letter would say, there's nothing more powerful than love. So I sent that little boy with hordes of doctors around him, all the love I could muster. Sense of humor is important too. My sense of humor even came back in that moment. Because when you're in the moment and you're not holding the chairs, again, your brain opens up to a lot of stuff that's positive. And one time the doctors came running out and they looked all proud and they go, Goose. I said, what? And they go, your kid has a brain. I said, what? He said, well, sometimes the kids aboard this deathly ill, we run a CAT scan, and they don't have a brain. This, we ran a CAT scan, your son has a complete brain. They look really proud. I said, wow, he's one step ahead of his old man. Would you get in there and find out what's wrong with my kid? You come in here and tell me he's got a brain. Come on now. And then they came and gave me all these tough life and death choices. I threw it. The grace of God and some of the stuff I'm practicing with you now. I can't control if he lives or dies. All I can do is make the best decision that I can. And uh, he, he got through that initial thing. He was in the hospital for about a month in the intensive care unit for a good chunk of it, NICU. He had open heart surgery at four months of age. He weighed seven pounds. 
Life is like a roller coaster, folks. It's up and it's down. You're going to have these high moments. You're going to have these low moments. We got out of that hospital, and we were on a high. We brought him home to North Carolina, the surgeries in Alabama. He went into congestive heart failure. Four months old. Five months old, he weighed six pounds. Back to Alabama, air ambulance, emergency open heart surgery. Month after month after month. Many of you have been through stuff like that or worse. How did we hold it together? Peggy and I bonded through the pain and learned we couldn't fix it for one another. All we could do was share our thoughts and observations and feelings on the day. We were aware of people praying for us literally all around the country that we never met. That was pretty nice. And I didn't have to work because he was, my boss let me go so we could see the kid 15 minutes four times a day. So Peggy and I, well, might as well go to lunch and try to enjoy what we can. Horrible time, but some good memories at the same time. And my little boy taught me, Dad, life can be tough. You're going to face adversity. He taught me, Dad, you got to grow where you're planted. Like my little, my little plant up there, did we lose my slide, but I had a little plant up there coming out of cement. That was my son. That little plant, when it was planted, it didn't have any soil, it didn't have any dirt, it didn't have any sunlight, it, didn't, it was in cement, for God's sake, and yet it found a way. That was my son. He found a way to take the next breath, and the next, and the next. And he survived. He became that little hockey player I told you about. And then he grew up, and he became a 30-year-old pain in the butt whom I love, I'm still trying to keep my promise to God to love him with all my heart and soul for as long as we have him. And I don't know how long we're going to have him. He's doing all right, but he's on a second pacemaker. That's not too cool when you're 30. But he still drives me nuts, and I love him with all my heart and soul. And my son taught me, Dad, you can do this. And El Paso, I want you to know, if he did it, you can do it, because you are El Paso friggin' strong. And it has been an honor to share what a little bit I've learned about this stuff and for me to come and spend time with you, my goodness gracious, I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. I'd be glad to connect with you if my slide comes back up, my email, and all that good stuff. And all I can say is, from my heart to yours, with gratitude, thank you. We can do better than that. Come on, El Paso. Let's thank him once again. I'm going to take a moment to ask that three very special people join me on the stage. We do have an El Paso gift. So please come and join your husband. And I'm going to ask Deputy City Manager, Mr. Marcus, and Deputy City Manager, Jerome, will you please help me to share this gift? Our City Manager had to leave um, on important business. So representing the City Manager's office will be Ms. Mr. Marcus and Mr. Jerome. <laughs> 